Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome here, uh, both those of you that groups that are uh, zooming in, and uh, this lovely crowd that's gathered here in the hall. Lovely to have you here. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mike Brownlee to you. Um, he speaks to us quite often, and um, it's always very interesting to hear what he's got to say. And today, we're going to be hearing about something close to our hearts with inflation going up and up and up. And we need to be guided in how to buy our groceries and be uh, discriminating. Um, Mike was born in, in, in Cape Town and educated at Rondebosch Boys High. He, um, uh, after school, he joined Lever, uh, Unilever. I grew up in Rhodesia, so I call it Lever Brothers. Unilever and graduated BSc uh, Chem from UCT in 1960. He managed uh, Lever Brothers product development unit in Durban and then in Port Sunlight in UK uh, and where he moved to factory management. He joined Broma Foods, which is Cadbury's food and drinks arm, in 1984 as a technical coordinator and became the MD in 1987. Became managing director of Robertson's, the Spices Group, in, from 1990 to 1995. Now you see he's got a, a, a huge record of professional expertise in this field. He retired to set up a consultancy in fast-moving consumer goods. And um, in his retirement now, he's very interested in training new young entrepreneurs. He tells me he writes plays and short stories. I've yet to read one. I look forward to that. And he plays golf and bridge. Lovely to have Mike here. Mike, thank you. And over to you. Thank you. Um, I don't like to do this, but I'm going to start with some rather boring stuff. Um, a few definitions. Um, sorry about that. Sorry, how do I take that off the screen? A little X, I guess. Okay. It's not working. Right, let me see what I can do. Why isn't he there? Right, we, um, uh, let's just. Keeps disappearing. We stop video okay. and we. Um, no. okay. There we go. Okay. Um, in the in the trade, um, what you call groceries, we call fast moving consumer goods, and uh, in this field, you have suppliers who can be these sort of people, and vendors who can be these sort of people. And I distinguish between the two because you will find that as the presentation proceeds, the, the, the motives of these two groups of people are completely different. Um, then you've got the authorities who make the rules. These guys, serve, civil servants, advertising standards, the standard authority. And branding is a very important part of what uh, these vendors and suppliers do and the way in which you respond to them. And I think particularly important is the fact that branding gives you consistency from purchase to purchase. Um, so when you go in and you want to buy uh, a piece of toilet soap or something, you're pretty sure that that's going to be exactly the same lux that you had last week when you bought it. Um, and if you go to your village market and you want to buy some olives or something, you've got a pretty good chance that those olives are going to be rather different from the olive you bought last time. That's why that's not a brand. Branding means you've got consistency from purchase to purchase. Okay, so vendors love competition. So uh, you'll find that a guy like uh, Pick and Pay, uh, he'll do anything to get more brands on the shelf to compete with each other. That's what he wants to do because as he, as he goes through that process, he can drive prices down, and that's what he wants, and of course, that's what you want. 
Um, so these are the sort of people who do that kind of thing. But you'll find that big, I'm talking about big suppliers like Unilever uh, and Coca-Cola and so on, they don't like competition at all uh, because competition means they're going to lose market share and that's not what they want. So these are the kind of guys who do that sort of thing. And unfortunately in South Africa, it's not like the uh, United States or, 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 Britain, or Britain or something like that, where you've got multiple brands available to you. In our small market, you've got a very li really limited number, sometimes a mon monopoly, sometimes a duopoly. And unfortunately that's going to give you uh, prices that will uh, rise rather faster than you would like. And these are the kind of people that dominate those particular markets. And so that's the effect of a uh, low degree of competition. Consumers are in a weak position because of the lack of competition. And the other point is that consumers, they love to get shopping done quickly. And this has quite a lot of big ramifications because when you're trying to get through things, Let's assume you're faced with a decision now. You've got to choose one of these kind of brands here. Every time, let's say you've got a shopping list of 20 items, and every time you come to a shelf like this, you have to spend time looking at prices, quality, names, advertising, etc., etc. It would take you about 10 weeks to get through your shopping. So what do you do? Um, you probably don't want to make a decision. The decision you made was made three years ago. You're just repeating that, repeating that purchase on that decision. And that's exactly what a big brand would want you to do. So the big brands will concentrate on two things. One is to have consistency and there's quality control, meaning the thing's going to be exactly the same as it used to be. And the other point is it's going to be on the shelf. To run out of stock on the shelf is total harikiri for this business. And uh, you might have noticed uh, one or two brands during lockdown suddenly ran out of stock. Those people would have lost market share. And that's very serious for that business. <clears throat> Generally speaking, consumers are quite easily persuaded. If you ask a consumer why they buy a specific brand, you'll find it's a very, it's not very well thought through because you haven't got time to think, think things through like it. It's not like buying a motor car or something. You're buying something small. So if I said to you, what kind of uh, a hair conditioner do you use? You'd probably tell me, oh, I use X, Y, Z, and you never think about the thing as to what it contains, what the opposition is, what the price comparisons are. You've got a rough idea, but that's, it's because speed is of the essence in, in the buying. <sighs> yes, uh, you all know about this. I think most of you would look at the sell by date on things like milk and so on and so forth. Um, but um, we're going to look at some labels just now. And there's very good reasons why you don't read, uh, read labels. We'll find out more about that. And in consumer research, the most frustrating thing for suppliers is to try and find out why you bought something. Remember, you made that decision five years ago. So for them to try and find out why you made that decision, it's very difficult. And very often you're going to give an answer that you think they'll want to hear, but it's not the right answer. So this is, this makes consumer research very dicey. Okay, so I want you to think about um, washing powder. And let's assume you had a choice of these three washing powders. Could you put your hand on your heart and say, I can tell the difference between this, this, and this? I don't think so. It's very difficult to discriminate something like that. And yet, you probably always buy Omo if Omo is your favorite brand. Um, and that's good for Omo, but maybe it's not good for you. Can you tell the difference between Kiwi and, and uh, Maggots shoe poles? I don't think so. <laughs> Difficult. This may be a little bit easier, but not much easier. This is this is easier because now you're using your taste buds. And when you're doing that, you would have a definite preference. 
Uh, and so in, in the field of curry powders, um, you can get some good answers. And the same with air fresheners. You either like the, the smell of the air fresh or you don't. And that's what that's all about. So I'm, I'm saying to you, I think consumers in a weak position, you may want to argue with that. I think that they, as a result of that, they need protection. And um, you find that the authorities do have uh, protection for you in the shape of something called the Food, Drugs and Disinfectant Act of 1937. Um, <clears throat> now it's been altered a few times, but um, uh, one wonders just how effective that is. So um, in, the, in the Food, Drugs and Disinfectant Act, these are the sort of things that, that must happen. The description must be legible and not misleading. Okay, used by sell by, yes, we know about that. Whether it comes from a foreign country or not, that's important. I don't know whether anybody reads nutritional ta uh, uh, tables here, uh, but um, you, it's very useful to medical people and so on. But for the man in the street, not really much use. This is a very important thing. The ingredients that go into any of these groceries, they've got to be shown in orders of in order of magnitude. So if the, if the, the biggest thing in your, let's say your spice mix is paprika, paprika will appear first and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a pretty useful thing to have. And then you want allergens, uh, which is uh, required by the, the medical people. And that's quite important as well. Let's talk about the Advertising Standards Authority of South Africa. You might think that's quite a good means for protecting you. Um, it was set up in 1968 by a number of suppliers, vendors, and advertising houses. Uh, I wonder whether those are the kind of people that are going to protect you. Uh, it's it's um, a moot point, but anyway, um, they control vendors quite strictly. Um, and any claim that is to be made has got to, you've got to produce a lot of evidence. And as a result, in this country, comparison with, with competitors is virtually prohibited. So um, when they, you're allowed to say it's it's the best, whatever it is, but you're not going to say it's better than so and so. Or if you do say that, you better just have some proof up your sleeve. The Advertising Standard Authority has no policing role. So if anybody puts advertising out there and nobody objects, that's fine. But if, usually you will find that a competitor will object and that's when they step in and say, okay, let's have a look and see whether this is actually uh, illegal or okay. It's a fact that vendors can find a lot of difficulty in finding a difference between themselves and other people in the market. So have a look at this. Now, this is a market leader. Hewlett's is a market leader in sugar. Um, but sugar is sugar. And yet most people, when they go into a supermarket, will just take the white packet off the shelf and that's the way, the way they go. Um, as it happens, uh, in the Western Cape, that's probably a good idea because the main opposition comes from the Transvaal, um, Eastern Transvaal somewhere, so that the, the freight on Salati sugar is quite high compared to uh, what it, what costs, uh, what Hewlett's costs. And so you will find that uh, buying this particular sugar is not a bad thing. But if we look at other commodities, how about coffee? Now, a lot of people think there's a lot of difference between this coffee and that coffee and so on and so forth. But basically, coffee is made in such a way that it's, it's, it's dried and it's ground and it's roasted. And it's the roast that counts. So you see numbers on, on coffee, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and if you like dark coffee, you'll take number five. 
they can make it lightly dose to take number one. And that's the only difference between Arab Arabica coffees. Tea is quite an interesting one because tea is controlled by tea tasters. Now, what tea, what tea tasters know about consumer research or what you prefer in tea, I'm not sure. But they seem to be the experts in what tea should taste like. And so that's what, what's happened in the tea business. And you'll find that probably there's not an awful lot of difference between major brands of tea. Flour, well, uh, there's, no, there's no market leader in flour. Uh, one finds that um, uh, you're into a situation where you've got cake flour and bread flour, different, different particle sizes. That's about all there is to it. And uh, you, can, you can pick and choose whichever brand you like. You can even have stone ground coffee flour if you like. If that's useful. And I'm afraid to say whatever they say about sea salt or molten salt, salt is salt. And uh, <coughs> um, you know, you should, you should, these things actually, these commodities, because they are 100% whatever they are, require no content label. So when you buy salt, it's 100% salt. Uh, if it's, if it's, some fancy salt and it's mixed with something, you have to have to show salt as an ingredient and whatever else is mixed with it. Um, but basically, Cerebos, um, see how it runs. Um, here's quite an interesting one. I mean, butter is butter, but it's, it depends on how it's produced and how it's packed. So if you go in and buy butter, and it's packed in a paper wrapper, you'll find that it will go rancid faster than if you put it in an aluminium foil wrapper. So in the winter time, it really doesn't matter what you buy. <coughs> but in the summertime, I suggest you stay with Moy River. <laughs> Milk is varying in terms of cream content. And also, uh, you look at this, the sell by date, that's, that's useful. This is an interesting one, olive oil. Um, vegetable oils are all produced, except olive oil is produced by a hot process. You take the, let's say sunflower oil, the raw sunflower oil, and you take out the free fatty acids, first of all, then you, uh, that's called a refining process, then you bleach it and you deodorize it. And it's all done under heat. And as a result, you can get a pure oil that way. Olive oil doesn't, is not done that way. Olive oil is cold pressed. And so as a result, you want to get the virgin, in other words, the first pressed, because that's the lowest behavior you can get in olive oil. And all the best olive oils are always telling you they are virgin, which means that they are the first pressing. <laughs> Sorry, somebody asked? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about advertising. I want to introduce you to this man. <coughs> His name is Hopkins, and he was working around about 1900. And uh, he was a top rate advertising executive. Um, and his first sortie into this was to work for uh, an outfit called Schlitz Beer, America. And he claimed that their bottles were cleaned with live steam. And that got Schlitz a lot of market shares as a lot of that. Um, um, but all the other guys also cleaned their bottles with steam. Um, but he was the first guy to claim that. So this is how he made his name. And then he went into the palm olive soap company and claimed that Cleopatra had used um, palm olive soap in <laughs> the year 2000, despite protest, protests from outraged historians. And then he noticed that in America, nobody brushed their teeth at all. And so Pepsodent, the Pepsodent company said, let's try and exploit this. And so he went into the toothpaste market 
And after 10 years of advertising Pepsodent, half of America was washing their, was brushing their teeth, uh, obviously with, with Pepsodent. So that was his claim to fame. And uh, <clears throat> he, he obviously um, did a number of things which upset a lot of people, but his remark was, people don't buy, don't buy from clouds. Uh, you know, I think I might take uh, issue with that, never mind. Okay, so how believable is the advertising that you see? I think you probably sort of have a jaundiced view of this thing, but let's, let's look a bit more in, a bit in detail here. Um, this is an ad that I picked up on a, on a jar of Melrose cheese. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, I'd like to get 20 million, that's, that's nice. So I thought I'd go after it. So I followed the, the line of this and uh, filled in the form, did all this kind of stuff, went on the website. And uh, when I got through all that, they gave me a choice of a bungee jump at Gowrips River or, or a visit to a red reptile park in Somerset West. That was as much as the 20 million I got, so I decided neither of those were <coughs> for, for me. Just have a look at this ad and see whether you pick up anything uh, untoward. So I'm like, guy. Can I have a line with this? Hey. That's a Vintook. That's 100% pure beer. You don't need any light. See for yourself. You know what? I'm good. Keep it real, Joe. Keep it real. Then took. Not for persons under the age of 18. Okay. Um, uh, you've probably seen that if you've watched golf, you've seen that quite often. Um, and what does it mean? Now, remember Schlitz. Uh, these guys are saying this is 100% pure beer, so therefore uh, that's a really bull point for Vintuk. But they are implying that the opposition is not 100% pure. You see how clever that is? And you can't fault that. You couldn't, you couldn't take that to the Advertising Standards Association because they would say, we didn't say that at all. We said this is just 100% pure beer. So this is the kind of subtlety that you get in advertising. So I'm like, guys. Hey. So I'm like, um, I'm just going to give you a little snapshot of what it costs to get listed in a supermarket. You go along with your with your brand that uh, the other guys, either the, the vendors either want or want or don't know about. Uh, there will be a listing fee, so it'll be okay just to list your product, a hundred thousand rand, just to start or if they're keen to get you competing with Coca-Cola or somebody like that, then maybe it'll only be 500 rand. Just depends on what the negotiation is. Then remember when you put things into a supermarket, you can't just leave them there. You can't just put them on the shelf. You have to pull them through. The supermarket's not going to do it for you. So you have to give deals and you have to put um, people in store to do a demonstration, a whole lot of stuff like that. And the cost of that can be anything like between 5 and 20% discount and possibly a couple of promotions for that. The broadsheets that the supermarkets put out, they're not for nothing. If they, if they, if you they ask you to put something into their broadsheet, that's going to cost you another 5 to 10% deal on uh, whatever you put in there. And then there's a thing called a confidential rebate. I mean, my boss, what the heck is that? If your sales is say, well, 100, you, 100 rands or 100,000 rands in year one, and year two, there are 150,000. They will want a percentage of the 50,000 growth that you've had. So that's, that's how that works. That's a confidential re rebate. Kick back to the vendor. And all of this 
stuff adds up to a heck of a lot. And it's the reason why you don't find small brands, insignificant brands in the supermarkets, because it's just, just too much of a load to bear. Let's have a look at rice. Now, most of you know what tastic rice is, and tastic will give you not one, but six different varieties over there. Uh, I'm a pretty reasonably normal shopper, I think. I either want sticky rice or long bread rice. The difference, yeah, if I'm making sushi or something, that's one thing. But if I'm boiling rice for a curry, it's another thing. I don't need six different varieties. But Tastic's very kind. They give you another five, uh, just to pick from. <clears throat> so you've got lots of choices. But they don't really, they put them in different colored packages. But they don't really tell you much about what, because rice is rice. Um, so what's the point of this? The point of this is to clutter the shelf. So I've given so many yards of shelf space. And I want to clutter that shelf as much as possible to prevent opposition getting the space. Okay. So Pioneer has got a thing called Specker. <laughs> trying to find its way in. Very difficult. <coughs> so this is the sort of monopoly stuff that can go on. So to summarize, suppliers are finding quite difficulty in making themselves different and they can use all sorts of exaggerations. <coughs> And they can block competitors. Let's have a look at shampoo. Quite an interesting one. This is a, brand, a Unilever brand. Um, and we'll look a little bit of detail as to what that's about. And in case you can't read what's on the label, I'll try and bring it up for you. And you'll notice that it contains organic aloe vera. Now, what do you think aloe vera does? No. <laughs> um, and if you look carefully at the advertising of this, was, there was a commercial of it. You would find that they would say, aloe vera helps you get conditioned air or something like that. Um, it's always couched in such a way that you can't really challenge it. Uh, but it's in a lot of things are inferred. Anyway, it's for normal hair, that's fair enough. And it's a natural nourishment from root to tip. What the heck does that mean? Okay. Let's take a look at the back label. Uh, what can you see there? Uh, you can see 200 low, that's useful. Unilever, that's useful. The barcode, that's useful. Anything else? I'll try and blow it up for you so you can see. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's have a look at the ingredients. Because that's, that's really interesting. What does it start with? It starts with something called aqua. <laughs> Okay, why would they call it aqua? Because a lot of people would just go straight over their head, kind of thing. But if you, you know, we, we know what aqua is. Um, if you go through this list, though, you will find that most of it has absolutely nothing to do with washing your hair. Um, there the are three function ingredients in shampoo. There's sodium lauryl ether sulfate, which is it's used in shampoos, uh, dishwashing liquids, that sort of stuff. Uh, then you've got this material, betaine, which is a foaming material. So this is going to make the other stuff foam like mad, which is going to impress you, I'm sure. And then you've got perfume. The perfume very important. Uh, and often you find that perfume becomes the discriminating item. In, a, in something like shampoo. So, pretty simple. Let's have a look at a Pantene ad and see whether you can pick up any. The secret's out. 
thousands of salon brand users would consider switching to this smart hair care buy. And they preferred it in a blind test. It's the new Pantene system. Hello, new Pantene. Okay, you've tried it. Talk to me. I hate split ends, the constant trimming, but with this Pantene, I can actually let it grow. No leading salon brand does that better than Pantene. New improved Pantene. Healthy makes it happen. Okay, what did you pick up from that? I'm sure you're all very impressed. Uh, they say they preferred it in a blind test. Now, it's possible that Pantene's got a lovely perfume. And the other product has got not much perfume, so therefore it would be preferred. But we're trying to find out whether Pantene is going to give you a better job of washing your hair than anything else. Mike, but this is both new and improved. <laughs> new and improved, yeah, they probably added more aqua. <laughs> I'm not sure. What did you learn about split ends? Well, you see that the implication is, or well, imp what's implied is that this, this shampoo actually repairs the split end because it's mentioned, but it goes, it goes by the by. And if you look at it carefully, they don't actually say that at all. And that no salon brand does that better than Pantene. You see the subtlety there? Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, just in case you think I'm cynical about all this stuff, it's not true. Um, um, let's have a look at jam for a minute. Um, when I was in the, in the business, uh, we were marketing jam and I, I set out to find a strawberry jam that tasted like strawberries. <laughs> Okay, well, after three years, I gave up because um, jam, when it's produced, is normally boiled uh, with sugar. And what happens is that all the top notes are lost and you're left with something that tastes like sugar. Um, and if you look at um, this product, this is, this is quite a good um, uh, thing from Woolworths, mixed berry jam, uh, but it's it's pr produced through probably through this boiling process and the result of that i mean anybody who's made jet jam at home knows that it's quite difficult to retain flavor in jam whereas this product imported from france um 50 raspberries sweetened with grape and apple juice and the vapor is no doubt condensed so what happens is as it Paper comes off, it's condensed and put back into the jam. And if you, anybody doing a blind taste of these two will definitely be able to tell the difference. That's nice. Uh, here's some more winners that I have. Uh, Black Cat is not just a, a winner because it's been there a long time. It's got more peanuts in it than anything else. And you find that a lot of people selling uh, peanut butter are putting a lot of starch into it. And as a result, it's cheaper, but it just doesn't taste as peanutty. Anybody making a curry would recognize this brand being a great base for any curry that you'd ever make. We all know about Mrs. Balls, still going strong and worth a fortune. And <laughs> In my household, we actually rather like um, streaky bacon that looks like that at the end of it. And um, this is the kind of brand that would actually do that when you find that a lot of others contain a lot of meat in them, not so much fat in them, are unable to produce that kind of result. But that's, this is my choice. You will all have your own choices of some winners. Um, let me just... I'm just going away from town for a minute. Uh, I'm have a minute to get. Why? 
Nobody can produce bromide like marmite. It's uh, produced in a plant that uh, uh, is almost like an oil refinery. It's, it's really complicated stuff. But anybody noticed that marmite ran out of stock? Uh, do you know why? Because it's made out of beer. Uh, they have a contract with the, beer, the breweries to produce to take away all the leaves, all the, all the bottoms of the, of the brewing, brewing process. And you would have noticed that the government said no more selling of beer at some stage. No more wine either. Let's make it stuck, I think. Here's another winner. Um, marmalade. Anybody who knows about marmalade knows that if, you, you, if you're going to make some marmalade, you better make it out of Seville oranges. Don't try and use ordinary oranges. It's not going to give you a good result. And I think in South Africa, we, we're lucky enough to have a plantation of Seville orange trees somewhere in Rustenburg, I think. And I think that's where these guys get their material from. So there are sorry, what is this says? You need to click on the blue button. The blue button. Yeah. Now I've got John Berman back again. <laughs> <laughs> comes up Where's the? We want to click there. I can't get this to click. There, there we go. Are. Excellent. No, no, we're off, off again. No, no, you won't keep it on because otherwise they can't keep it on. Yeah, but I've done. It was on. Now we've switched it off. Just put press on start my video. It was on video, but the, the camera is not on. Oh, John Burton again. Okay. No idea. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. Okay, won't worry about it. Um, going to change the subject completely now. Going to talk about hard surface clean, and we'll have a few few facts. Um, all hard surface cleaners. Uh, contain small detergent content. So this is a hard surface cleaner that we all know. And here's a, uh, this, this material contains a detergent with chalk, which is a mild abrasion. Uh, chalk is the sort of stuff you use in toothpaste. And um, that makes handy dandy, handy dandy in a, in a hard surface application very effective. Um, but a lot of people uh, don't want any, uh, they're not trying to take, uh, let's say, shoe polish off the floor or something like that. Uh, they want to just clean the surface. So you don't need to have an abrasive in it. Um, and so you would have come across a product like this. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> that spray model costs a lot of money. And so when you buy this product, you're going to pay through the neck. You might pay 20 on rands for the handy handy, but you probably pay about 40 or 40 something for uh, Mr. Muscle. Um, and some of us figure that it'd be a good idea to try and reuse that nozzle. But when you try and pour handy handy into that, you find the chalk actually blocks the nozzle, so that doesn't work. Um, uh, so you turn, so okay, I'll take some, some uh, sunlight uh, washing powder and stir it up in some water and pour it in there and see how that works. There's a material called silicate in there that also blocks the market, so that's not going to work. But um, you've got a product like this, um, uh, auto, which doesn't contain anything that blocks the nozzle. And if you put two tablespoons of this stuff into that bottle and screw the back of the lid, you've got yourself a half surface cleaner. So that's pretty simple. And uh, um, it's, um, uh, it's the kind of thing that can obviously be quite a good saving. Question is, is this really coffee? Uh, the quote at the bottom is not mine. Neither Frisco nor coffee, three coffee, qualify for the coffee name. They're not allowed to call it this coffee at all. 
because it needs to contain 75% of coffee to be called coffee. Um, these things contain about less than 25% coffee, the rest is chicory, and chicory costs about one-tenth of coffee. So um, that's what those things, but you notice that the clever way in which they call the thing Rick coffee or coffee hosts. Uh, nobody can stop them doing that. And that implies that they are coffee. Not really. Um, the other reason why they're not, they don't taste very good is that uh, this drying air that you see top there comes in at about 250 degrees centigrade. So the, the material is fed into the spray dryer and subjected to this high temperature. And as a result, you see that little, little brown arrow to the right, that's all the top notes that are being lost. And so that's another reason why spray drying coffee is really not a very good idea. So that's what uh, re-coffee costs. If you want pure coffee and not coffee chicory mixture, then you would pick something like uh, Nescafe at 95 grams. And then if you want something even better than that, you might pick these two brands. And of course, um, um, Luckily, you don't, when you want to try whether this, these, these products, Nescafe and Jacobs, Nescafe Gold, are freeze dried. Very expensive process. In other words, they avoid spray drying. Um, and uh, once again, it looks like a petrol refinery when you have a look at the plant that they've reduced on. Uh, if you don't want to pay 114 or 116 rands to tar sample it, you can buy a little sampler like that and you test it. And I'm afraid to say that when I compare it with what I normally do, which is to use a, a plunger and normal coffee, this thing doesn't stick. So, um, um, and I think you probably, some of you might be using Jacobs or whatever it is, and you might, might argue with me about that, but uh, it's quite an interesting debate. Until 1973, margarine was white. And um, uh, marg margarine at that time contained 16% max of water because butter contains 60% of water. And uh, the boss of this market was a brand called Stork. And they majored on beat and bake. That was what they were talking about. Um, and then um, the, uh, the oilseed control board gained supremacy over the butter control board and margarine was allowed to go yellow. And uh, this is what happened to butter. It dropped from 100,000 tons a year to 10,000. Uh, it was regarded by um, the guys who, in the butter business as the margarine debacle. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, um, and of course, you, at the time, these two brands took precedence and they blew away all the opposition. I mean, things like Blossom and so on, so we just couldn't match uh, the expertise that Unilever had with Flora and Brahma. It was called, I think it was called Floro at that time. Subsequently changed to Flora. And then the margarine people started to discover that they could add more water than 60%. Uh, and in fact, you had a thing called halberine that was half water and half, and half fat and half water. And um, uh, this led to, uh, uh, shall we say, a spread war because you weren't allowed to call it a, mar a margarine anymore, you had to call it a spread. And if you go into the supermarkets and have a look today, you'll find 
there's probably one brand of, of margarine left, all the rest are spreads. And they contain anything up to 60% water. So if you want to put water onto your toast, well, go for it. <laughs> but uh, I, I would suggest that, uh, you know, you need to be quite discriminating when, when using these, these so-called spreads. Let's say something about spices. Um, until 1970, I suppose, Robertson's was a tiny company in Natal that did uh, spices and one or two other things like Chase Fluid and Stevens Ink and all sorts of stuff. And um, they were in the, in terms of spices, they were in the shadow of a company called Hind Brothers. And Hind Brothers were the boss of the spice market. Um, and unfortunately for Hind Brothers, they made a decision Robertson's obviously packing spices in glass bottles, and Robertson switched uh, Heinz pitch to plastic bottles. And consumers do not like spices in plastic bottles. And Robertson's immediately increased their market share. And I think Heinz is still there, but it's 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 a fairly minor player. Um, these are the major brands of the Robertson's, uh, <coughs> Robertson's uh, stable, steak and chopped spice and master blend, rice spice, rice spice. These are the big sellers in this range. So I thought we'd just have a look at the label. There's a label, the chicken spice label. And I'm looking carefully and I see the first ingredient is salt. Then corn flour. Now we're buying spice here. And then there's gone black pepper. And so on and so on and so on. Now this product is actually very well formulated. It's very good uh, from this point of view. But if I want to buy salt or corn flour, I'll buy salt and corn flour. I'm not going to buy this stuff. Uh, although I think Carol would object to that. She she likes this one. Um, just a, on, on, a, on that note, I, um, I went out to buy some Chinese slice spice and uh, noticed that the first ingredient is sea salt. Okay. So well, I think I'll have to go back to making my own. <coughs> okay, now if you bring this one up, you can see the salt in the maze and so on and so forth, but you can see no MSG added, no preservatives, vegan friendly. What does that mean? I'm not sure what all that means. Anyway. Um, should we have a look at um, some of the liquid? Oh, there's not enough sunlight to clean us all. Relax, a bottle of sunlight cleans more dishes than you'd expect. Sunlight Lemon 100, one bottle cleans up to 30,000 dishes. Okay, um, that's, that's quite a nice claim. Um, we're talking additives though. And you notice that they put lemon in this product. What do you think lemon does? Nothing. Okay. But they put it in as part of an advertising to imply that it's the lemon that's actually doing the work, when that's not actually true. Um, a lot of people have got this idea that, that lemon in shampoo or lemon in uh, or dishwashing liquid or whatever it is, is useful for um, cutting grease and so on and so forth. That's not true at all, but uh, there it is in the advertising and it's not, they're not saying lemon juice does X, Y, and Z, they're saying it contains lemon and it's up to you then to interpret. Toothpaste.
It's tingling fresh. It's fresh as ice. It's Gibbs SR toothpaste. The tingling fresh toothpaste that does your gums good too. The tingle you get when you brush with SR is much more than a nice taste. It's a tingle of health. It tells you something very important, that you're doing your gums good and toughening them to resist infection. And as this chart shows, gum infection is the cause of more tooth losses than decay itself. The tingle in SR comes from sodium ricinoleate, a substance which both dental research and years of use in dental practice have shown to be good for the gums. So, to keep your teeth white as snow, your gums really healthy and your breath really fresh, see your dentist regularly and brush with SR, the tingling fresh toothpaste for teeth and gums. Gibbs SR. Now, I've intentionally shown you a very old ad. This is added in 1955. Um, and, um, but it contains all the kind of suggestions that are necessary to convince you without actually declaring that this is, I mean, uh, sodium ricinoleate, in fact, is soap. That's what it is, it's soap. And uh, the problem with soap is that when you put soap in your mouth, it doesn't taste very good. So therefore you put a lot of peppermint and spearmint oil to try and mask they did in trying to mask the taste of, of uh, the soap. Uh, today they use more sophisticated detergent materials to clean, to do the cleaning job. But uh, um, toothpaste is basically a mixture of glycerine, chalk, and peppermint spearmint oils. That's, that's basically it. And uh, um, over the years, you will have seen uh, a number of people trying to claim all sorts of things for toothpaste. It seems to be something that's quite a favorite uh, amongst people, uh, the advertising people. Um, how about this one? I don't know if anybody remembers Mentosol. This came along in 1953. Um, it contained chlorophyll, and it, the claim was that it made your breath fresh. And it really took a big chunk out of market leader Colgate's market share uh, to the point where Colgate actually had to put um, chlorophyll into Colgate toothpaste to try and compete with these guys. <clears throat> but I have to say that Metasol lasted two years and after that its market share dropped to 1%. So you get, eventually you get found out when people they realize that actually with chlorophyll, it doesn't do anything for your breath at all. In fact, the only things that have happened in toothpaste over 100 years have been uh, Hopkins' launch of Pepsodent, which got 50% of Americans to brush their teeth. And this product, Crest, Procter & Gamble's product, which they spent years uh, producing research which showed that fluoride was actually able to prevent tooth decay. Those are the only two really significant moves in toothpaste. A uh, presentation like this would be, uh, would be rhythm to me not to uh, mention house brands. Um, let's have a look at uh, a typical house brand stand, standoff. Here we have, um, I don't know if you can see that, Stay Soft leading brand. Uh, and clicks fabric softener, and you can see that the, the saving on that is about mm, just about twenty percent. Um, now uh, that's quite nicely packaged, um, but usually you find that, that uh, house brands are not beautifully packaged at all. They are drab, intentionally drab, so that you feel you must feel when you buy it that this house brand. Oh, you're going down market now. And um, that's that's the intention. It also keeps all the, the big brands happy. But their fancy packaging is not uh, being competed with, competed uh, for with, with, but this, I think this clicks uh, package is actually not too bad. When you come to buy a house block, what you should be saying to yourself is, is this the same stuff? that is in the safe uh, thing. 
And you probably, usually you would say, no, I don't think it is. Um, in this case, I think you'd be wrong. You'd find that uh, uh, fabric softeners are fabric softeners. And uh, they contain uh, usually 5 or 6% of a material called Ocrep 2HT, which is a cationic detergent. And what that does is when it goes into action, it finds any anionic detergent uh, which is left in the clothes and it neutralizes those. Uh, and therefore, you get a soft feel uh, on, on the, the finished product. Um, so uh, that's what you've got to look for. Um, but I must say that I found another winner in house brands. Um, Pot of Gold is part of the sale of OK Bazaars to ShopRite for one round. And uh, they also, apart from buying all the stores and, and all the debt and everything else, they bought the brand Pot of Gold and they've done quite well with it. So check us out. Um, this is coconut cream. Um, there's a difference between coconut cream, is, which is 78% coconut, um, coconut milk, which is about 55% coconut, and light coconut cream or coconut milk, which is about 30%. Well, then take the take this stuff and pour water into it, put it into a can. So if you're going to buy coconut, you might as well buy the concentrated stuff. And this is very nicely priced. So uh, that, I think, is, a, is another winner. So just to summarize a good way to shop, you must decide what's important to you. Um, if it's important to you to have a white packet for sugar, OK, that's fine. That's, then you must buy the, the, the product in that, in that kind of packaging. And if you can't discriminate, you really put your hand on your heart and you can't discriminate in this field, you're buying salt or whatever it is, then I suggest you buy on price. Brand loyalty is actually going to cost you uh, because it's going to stop you from looking around at different prices and so on and so forth. Um, so I suggest that being, uh, I mean, I would definitely buy the brand loyalty, that one, because there ain't any opposition. If you can take the time, it's actually quite interesting. Read the label sometime. If you can read it, it's usually in such small print. And just as a, uh, this is this is what happened to me. I, I was I was a great. I used to be a great fan of Roger Curry Powell, and then I started to read the label, and I found that uh, the major ingredient was flour. Um, well, you know, if I want to buy flour, I'll buy flour. So I now make my own uh, curry powder. And if you if you have a curry powder that's made only of spices, it's called a masala, M-A-S-A-L-A. -A. That's what it's called. So if you can find a masala in the, in the supermarket, then that's that's the pure stuff. Uh, it'll probably contain a lot of chili, but nevertheless, it's it's uh, all spices. And just a punch for South by South Africa, if you if you really have to have white, whiter than white butter, then you might as well go and buy uh, dairy, dairy, whatever it is, or Irish butter or Danish butter or something like that. But if you can possibly uh, buy South African, then I think it's quite a good idea. That's it. Uh, let's see if we can... There we go. We open. No man, we're out of that. There we go. Right, Mike. Mike, I'm sure is happy to answer questions. Um, uh, you know, I find things do work differently. I've tried so many shampoos, so I don't believe you when you tell me they're all the same. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying read the label. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I can't remember what I used when I was living in England. I think it was Persil or something, this, uh, uh, um, uh, 
washing powder. Yeah. Does that sound right? And my parents came down from Zimbabwe uh, and stayed with my, my um, sister uh, in Krabo. And when we bought the house and we moved in, we bought Skip because that's what Martina was using and that's what I've used ever since. So it's, uh, it's very difficult, I think, to shift from a, a, a brand. But I'm sure um, Mike will be happy to answer some questions, either on Zoom or here in the hall. Anyone in the hall with a question or a comment? Philip, would you like to come up? Come up here. Mike, would you like to comment on online shopping and how it impacts what you've been telling us? Okay. Um, See, online shopping is, uh, you're really getting to, much more into the science now because if you, if, you, if you shop online, I presume you would then make some sort of comparison. And if you make comparisons in terms of uh, what, you, what you're looking at and the pricing that you've got, uh, you are much, probably much more tempted to try something different. But remember my first remark, if you can discriminate, you must decide whether you can discriminate. Uh, you can put a whole list of things and say, tick, 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 cross, can't discriminate, can't discriminate. Those are the sort of things which you can afford to, um, you can make some, uh, and, take, and because you're online, you're taking a bit of time about it. Uh, you're not just going to take things off the shelf. I, um, I can remember going uh, into a, 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 an English supermarket once, sort of hiding and waiting for some girl because I was interested in personal. And as she put a hand on the pack of personal, I said, why did you do that? And she said, because I did it last week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see there's something on the, the, the chat. Let's just have a look at that. Um, is it, this is um, Peter van Nekerk. Is it worth paying more for baking powder than for plain bicarb. <clears throat> baking powder is a 50% mixture of tartaric acid and bicarb. So if you want to make your own baking powder, just buy those two and mix them. Um, I've got another question here, um, Rod. Uh, yeah, hi, Mike. Just, just one, one question uh, from me about the provenance of foods you buy in supermarkets. It seems to me that if you're buying vegetables, they always tell you where they came from and fruit. So you'll get, you'll get, you know, fruit from Egypt, vegetables from uh, beans from Zambia or Kenya. But when it comes to chicken, it is impossible. You do not know where your chicken comes from. Why is that? Okay. Um, Unless it says L. <laughs> the reason for that is because nobody's objecting. That's the reason. Um, and uh, if, if there is a regulation which says you must show, um, and there is, you must show on the pack where it comes from, if it comes from, if it particularly comes from a foreign country. Uh, if it's not shown, it's illegal. And if nobody's objecting to it, then, then that's the way it's going to be. As I said, the Advertising Standards Association does not step in until somebody raises a flag and says, no, it's not on. But chicken is quite an interesting one. Um, you would have heard all about uh, the, the, the Americans shipping brine chicken to us, um, obviously in, in the frozen form. And when you fry, freeze chicken, you can fill them up with brine and then you can say, well, that it makes it tender and all the stuff like that. But the uh, fact is, it's actually making you buy salt water at the price of, of uh, chicken. And uh, it only does, it, I don't think it applies to the kind of chicken that you buy in, you know, in, uh, let's say, chicken fillets or whatever the case may be. But whole chickens, I think you must be careful. Uh, I don't understand. If I buy, buy a, um, a whole chicken that says it comes from Elgin, does it not come from Elgin? No, oh, it must come from Yeah. So, uh, Rod, you're suggesting that, that um, uh, 
you don't know where chickens come from when you buy. The suggestion is that, in fact, we often don't know there is no uh, country of origin. But, Mike, you say that's that's illegal. Testing, yeah. Indeed. It's important. It must be shown. But I think the, the point is that if, uh, if, for example, Rainbow was to import Zambian chicken and process it and actually pack it in their factory, very little that you can do to prove that that's not local chicken. Oh, really. So this is this is the difficulty. So um, it would be it would be different if it was uh, let's say a, a specific brand that was not processed locally. Then I think you could uh, take that one up. Okay. Good. Just uh, uh, they were, the Zoom people wouldn't have asked, uh, heard the question, so just for okay. Um, apparently, Woolies sourced all of their chicken from who is that? Johan Ferry in Potchefstroom. Well, it's not only Johan Ferry, it's a smaller family, originally, it's only from Potchefstroom. You know, buy a baby. Buy a baby's dog. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Anyone on Zoom with a question? Right, we've got one here in the hall, David. Mike, I had this uh, idea, I don't know where I got it from, that house brands are known brands for the marketing and merchandising stripped out. So it's actually not manufactured by the uh, retailer or grown or whatever it is a known brand but it's just so you're buying the right quality for uh, okay. this price. deal with that uh, let me explain how house brands work um remember the pick and pays and the checkers of this world have no factories of their own so they rely they're going to rely on normal suppliers to pack uh, to uh, produce or pack their house brands for them um, and what they'll argue, they'll go along to, let's say, Coca Cola. And they'll say, right, what we want you to do is, I'll give you a bottle. It's a different bottle from Coca Cola, but I want you to put Coca Cola inside it. And what will that happen? It'll, it'll improve your throughput. So you're going to bigger throughput in your factories, much more uh, efficient, and so on and so forth. Now, Coca Cola will argue and say, hang on, look at me. So of that, people are going to tweet, hey, this tastes just like Coca Cola. And they're going to buy it at a lower price. It's going to erode my market uh, share. So you'll find that the leading brands will have no part to play in this. But the number two brand, you know, if Pepsi Cola was here, for example, they might entertain that idea and say, okay, uh, this is a way of expanding our share in the market. And uh, that's where, and usually that would be the case. You'll find that number two, number three, or number four in the market will go this route. And manufacture for uh, the supermarkets. Um, when I arrived at Bromo Foods, I found to my horror that the um, two litre uh, orange squash that we were packing for pick and pay was actually Oros inside the bottle. And the people were twigging this because Oros is really one of those brands that does stand out, it's, it's different. And at the market, the market share of this thing was climbing and climbing and climbing. And eventually I said to the sales guys, listen, you, sorry, but uh, you're going to have to give them a few price increases. So they went along to pick and pay. And pick and pay took their piece of paper, folded it up into a paper airplane and threw it out the window. Uh, no, we're not going to take a price increase. So eventually um, what happened was they said, I tell you what, we we'll leave the price where it is, 
but we can't afford to put sugar in the product. We'll put artificial sweetener in it and pick and pay, we'll pay for that. And immediately that happened, the market share went like this. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that goes on. Um, uh, there is no question that uh, um, house brands, uh, it's particularly easy, for example, a thing like jelly. Now, jelly is just sugar with uh, flavor, basically, and some, and some um, other goodies to make it go solid. Um, and uh, so you'll find that um, uh, somebody like Trotters, for example, which has got a minor market share, would love to make uh, jelly for checkers or pick and play. And so that's what they would do, and that would increase the uh, throughput in their factory, and that produces a pretty good product. Are there any more questions? I think we probably are running out of time. Mike, that was very, very interesting because it's very difficult to know what to buy because there is such a variety. Um, and you've given us some guidelines. My eyesight is too poor for me to read what's on the, <laughs> on the label, but we've, we've got some guidelines. Thank you very much. It's lovely that you can bring your expertise in this very delicate subject and come and share that with us. Thank you very much Pleasure. indeed. Thank you.